It's wonderful to see you here tonight. We are so energized by all of you being here to hear Whitney Johnson talk about uh, transformational learning and disruption. But before we introduce Whitney, I want to just say a few words. I'm Joan Bigham, and along with my co-chair, Tej Anon. Tej, would you stand up for a second? We are the founders and perpetrators of Aegis for Life, and that is the Alumni Association of Aegis graduates and our community of faculty and current students, Aegis 27. Um, we formed this network to give everyone in the Aegis community support, stimulation, and motivation, and this is our fourth annual tribute to Jack Mesereau. So for those of you, especially 27, who are new, just a couple of sentences. Jack Mesero was the visionary founder of the Aegis program here at Teachers College at Columbia. And we've developed this lecture series to give a tribute to him every year. And you'll hear much more about his ideas from Whitney and Tej as the evening goes on. And for those of you who are new, um, I mentioned Aegis, the Aegis Network. You are all now members of the Aegis Network and also soon to be members of the Aegis Alumni Network, and Elisa, are you here? She's working. I want to thank Elisa, who was the organizer of all of this and has been doing a lot of the communication. <laughs> and we'd like to tell you that when you become a member of Aegis for Life, it's like the Hotel California. You can check in, but you can never check out. <laughs> no. Let me talk about Whitney Johnson. She's a friend and she's from the business community, which is really a refreshing contrast for us from some of the speakers we've had who have been academic and education experts. Whitney has written a series of books. The one that I'm most familiar with, Disrupt Yourself, is the foundation of her framework that she'll be sharing with you tonight. And she has a new book, Build an A-Team, which you'll have a chance to look at later in the evening. Because she's from the business community, she is on LinkedIn as a disruptor. And I think she has over a million followers. Am I close to being correct? Um, she began her most recent business career, and she'll tell you more about that later, uh, as a co-founder of the Disruption, Disruptive Innovation Foundation with Clay Christensen, who is um, at one point recognized as the number one management thinker in the world. And it just so happens that Whitney is also recognized by that same organization as one of the top 50 management thinkers in the world. So we're really proud to have her here tonight. So I mentioned her LinkedIn profile. Her blog is amazing. She'll tell you more about that. And I guess I'll just wrap up by saying I want to personally thank her for coming to New York tonight from Charlottesville, where her family is packing up and moving to a new home. So thank you for that disruption in your life. We appreciate that. Um, after the, her remarks, Tej will help us with our Q&A session. Um, please meet Whitney Johnson. Actually, Joan, I think I should be the one thanking you because I don't have to help move and we all know moving is very difficult. Okay. All right. And just to get this out of the way, Dr. Volpe told me that if I flicked my hair, she would clap. So we're going to practice right now. <laughs> Flick my hair. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, it's an honor to be with you um, for this fourth annual tribute to Jack Mesereau. And it's a pleasure, just a pleasure to be here. Um, Joan, as you, if you haven't met her yet, you'll know that she is a force, and I'm grateful to have been able to be pulled into her orbit. When I was about eight years old, I discovered a piano in one of my grandparents' spare bedrooms. It was an upright piano, and on the stand of that piano, there was this book that said, Beginning Piano for Adults. My grandma Wilson, grandma Charlotte, was a kindergarten teacher by day, but by night, she was learning how to play the piano. Perhaps because I was going to speak to you these many decades later, I have this snapshot in my brain of what I thought and what I felt when I saw that book. And it went something like, silly grandma, learning is for kids. Why I believe that, I don't know. 
but I did believe that learning was only for children. So I find it a little ironic that tonight I'm standing before you today delivering this fourth annual tribute to Jack Mesereau, a pioneer in adult learning. How did I get here? And more importantly, how did you get here? None of you are children. All of you are adults, mid-career, getting or have gotten your PhD in adult learning. How did you get here? Well, you disrupted yourself. When I graduated from college, in music, by the way, my husband and I came here to New York so he could get his PhD actually here at Columbia. I can still feel the terror I felt as we drove across the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan. For the first week, I wouldn't go anywhere by myself. But we needed to eat, so I had to leave our 19th floor apartment and get a job. Because I had never set foot in a business course, had zero connections, clearly very little confidence, and at the risk of stating the obvious, I was a woman. My first job was as a secretary, 1345 at Smith Barney, 1345 Avenue of the Americas. Across from my desk, there was a bullpen. Young male stockbrokers, aspiring masters of the universe. This was the era of liars, poker, bonfire, the vanities, working girl. The pressure to open accounts, it was intense. They'd say things like, throw down your pom-poms and get in the game. I was slightly offended at first. I was a cheerleader in high school. But after hearing this over and over again and realizing that I'm going to be working at least five years, my husband's PhD is going to take at least five years, and by the way, it took seven years. Why would I make X when 10X is a possibility? And these guys are not any smarter than me. I realized it was time for me to throw down my pom-poms. Though I wouldn't have known to call it this then, this was the beginning of me disrupting myself. Started taking business courses at night, economics, accounting, finance. Within two years, I was able to move from secretary to investment banker. And if you've worked on Wall Street, you know that rarely happens. I then moved from banking to equity research, had two children, a very big disruption, left Wall Street to become an entrepreneur, co-founded a firm with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. And now many more disruptions later, I've become an author, a researcher, and I've codified a framework of personal disruption that I get to teach to organizations around the world, that I get to teach to you. But that was the beginning. That was the beginning. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, over the next couple of minutes. More specifically, what I'd like to do is, first of all, introduce you to this framework of personal disruption. I then want to outline at a very high level, I've read Patricia Cranton's book, so I think I know something, at a very high level what I know about transformative learning. And then third, I'll combine what I know about the two, do a sort of mashup, look at my personal disruption through the lens of transformative learning. All right, so let's start with the framework of personal disruption. And let me define for you what do I mean when I say disruptive innovation. Show of hands, how many of you when you were in school, not this school, but when you were younger, although it could be this school, how many of you were sent to the principal's office? Huh, a lot of early disruptors. <laughs> you were all these silly little things and now, well, you're taking over the world. Like, not moving. Elisa, what do we do? The clicker is disrupting me. Okay, here we go. So the telephone disrupted the telegraph. The automobile disrupted the horse and buggy. More recently, we've seen Netflix disrupt Blockbuster and now cable TV. And Uber disrupted caps. A disruptor secures a foothold at the low end of the market. Think about Netflix in the 90s. Initially, its products were inferior, its position is weak. Blockbuster could have crushed them like a cockroach, but they didn't. Market leaders rarely bother. It's just a silly little door-to-door -door DVD rental service. Let's go after bigger, better. 
the bad news or the good, depending on your point of view, is that once a disruptor gains a foothold, it too is motivated by bigger, better, stranger things. And so it goes. And why are they so motivated? Because according to the theory of disruption, the odds of success are six times higher and the revenue opportunity 20 times greater. Personal disruption then is how you take all of these ideas and make them meaningful to you. You start at the bottom of a ladder, you climb to the top and then you jump to the bottom of a new ladder like the children's game, shoots and ladders. Lady Gaga. Help, thank you. She, oh, hold it up. Oh, point it there, okay, point it there. Lady Gaga, she is a master of personal disruption. In 2008, she goes straight to the top of the charts and what does she do for an encore? She jumps to the bottom of a new ladder, one that could easily have put off her fan base. What does she do? She collaborates with Tony Bennett on a jazz album. She does a Sound of Music tribute, Lady Gaga, at the Oscars, and then she produces a country album. But her jump, it paid off. Her performance at the Super Bowl in 2017 had the largest music audience ever, and now a star is born. That's personal, personal disruption. It's a cycle where you learn, you leap, and you repeat. Can you just do the slides for me? Yeah? You can do them for me? OK, cool. Thank you. So I'll just kind of go like this, and then you will magically transfer them. Yeah, OK, cool. OK, so the one major difference is that you, with personal disruption, your Netflix and your Blockbuster, you are Uber and your cabs, you're the silly little thing, and you take over the world because you are disrupting you. And you're motivated because of dopamine. Whenever you learn something new, you get this, this dose, this squirt of dopamine in your brain, a chemical that makes you feel happy. So you learn, leap, and repeat over and over and over again. Think about your life. You have disrupted a lot. High school, college, first job, and now this PhD. You learned, you leaped, and you repeated over and over again. Now, to emphasize how powerful, how important personal disruption is, I want you to take a look at this broken asphalt and just stay with me. Broken asphalt can resist thousands of pounds of pressure. So why did it break? At one point, there was a tiny crack. It was almost invisible, and then it rained, it snowed, the water froze, expanded, and it broke because even though asphalt can handle external pressure, it can't handle internal pressure. We're like asphalt. Whenever change comes, we feel under siege. And so we do more of what we've been doing, hoping to resist the, the, the forces that are pounding against us. But if you have the courage to do more of what you have not been doing, this is where our inability to handle internal pressure can actually work. It can work in our favor. Just a few small changes like drops of water permeate, expand, breaking our hold on the past just enough to create space for something new and different. Leo Tolstoy, famous Russian author, he knew about external pressure. He wrote the book War and Peace. But he also knew about internal pressure. Here's what he had to say. Revolutions are an attempt to shatter the power of evil by violence. We think that by hammering upon the mass, we can break it into fragments. But this only makes it more dense and impermeable. Disruptive movement must come from within. Let me say that again. Disruptive movement must come come from within. So companies up in companies and industries, people disrupt their careers and their lives. 
So that's the framework of personal disruption at a very, very high level. Now what I want to do is walk you through my basic understanding of transformative learning. And again, thank you, Ted, for sending me Patricia Cranton's book. Here are the five points. Here's what I understand. Habits of mind, how we think about ourselves, about others, about the world, are uncritically absorbed from our families, community, and culture. Transformative learning is a process by which we question these assumptions. Our questioning is typically catalyzed by a disorienting event, like with Joseph Campbell's call to adventure in the hero's journey. At which point we begin, or had the invitation to begin, I'm gonna, can I move this, please? Thank you. Okay, at which point we begin a process of self-reflection, asking questions like, what are my assumptions? How do I know my assumptions are valid? And why should I revise or not revise my perspective? These questions then, if seriously asked and answered, allow us to transform from who we are to who we want to be, and dare I say, to who we were meant to be. So that's 30,000 feet. Is that it? Did I get it? Okay, 30,000 feet. So now, we've looked at what the framework of personal disruption is. We've looked, walked through, the, for the purposes of this conversation, my understanding of Mesereau's theory of transformational learning. What I'd like to now do is, as I said a minute ago, a mashup. I want to look at four stories of personal disruption where I disrupted myself, but as seen through the lens of transformational learning. So let's start with the first story. And to do that, I want to go back to and analyze when I first came here to New York. Now, in a conversation with Joan, she made a really intriguing observation. She said, you know, when you arrived here, when you were newly married, you needed a roof over your head. You did what you needed to do to survive. That's not necessarily an insightful choice, according to Mesereau's theory. I love that she said that because it got me to asking more questions. Now, instinctively, I knew that I was making these conscious choices, conscious decisions, but if the, I came to Wall Street and did this, wasn't it, then what was? When I was 24, I met a young man that I liked. I liked him a lot, but I was afraid. My parents' marriage had not been good. My mother had gotten pregnant, so they got married, and they never really loved each other. In addition to that, my dad was also a serial philanderer and an embezzler. So to marry this man, I was going to have to change my point of view. I was going to have to disrupt my thinking that my husband would be just like my father. Then there was the fear that if I married, had children within a year, became a stay-at-home mom like pretty much every other woman within my faith tradition was doing, I would lose my identity. So I did what one tends to do in these situations when one wants to be emancipated from your current belief system. Out of fear, you double down on your current beliefs, i.e., my husband will be just like my father. And so I sabotaged the relationship. I did that. Our courtship was a misery, but for the great, for, not for me, for my husband. But for the grace of God, he still married me. He still married me. Sometimes you need help to disrupt, to transform. Thankfully, my husband saw me for who I could be. So looking at these habits of mine, beliefs that I had absorbed, I believed that my husband would be just like my father. He isn't. Marrying him was the best decision I've ever made. I believe that once married, I was supposed to have children immediately. We didn't. We waited for 10 years. I believed that I would lose my identity by having children. I didn't. I not only haven't lost myself, I've become more me than ever. And I believed that I shouldn't have a career. I wasn't allowed to have a career, but as you may have noticed, I do. But there's a prior choice, more foundational, one that would inform all of my decisions around marriage, family, work, 
education, which was my faith tradition. On this decision, I was, in my, I was in the trenches during my 20s. I had always believed in God, but did I really? What did I believe about him? I had to turn these beliefs over, examine them, validate them. You may have surmised where I've landed, but for me, this quote from Stevie Wonder and Songs in the Key of Life encapsulates it well. He said, you can bet your life, and that, and twice it's double, that God knew exactly where he wanted you to be placed. Now let me ask you this question. What do you believe about marriage, about family, about work, about education? What do you believe about religion? How do you know these assumptions that you're holding, how do you know that they're valid? And is it time to disrupt your thinking? All right, story number two. This is when I left Wall Street. After eight years as an award-winning equity analyst, I reached out to my boss about moving on to the management track. I said, you know, I'd really like to try something new. And I got the old saw, really, no, really, we like you right where you are. It's 2004, and I've now read The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen and had this kernel of an idea that this theory, it's not just about products, it's about people. To move forward, I'd have to take a step back. So within a year, I quit. Now, my boss at the time said, you're going to regret this. And to observers, disruption frequently does, does look like this. <laughs> it wasn't easy. I went from a prestigious, well-paying job to no job. But I remember a very distinct moment when I was reading The Innovator's Dilemma, realizing that if I was going to get where I wanted to go, which was very vague, but there was somehow this place that I needed to go. If I was going to get there, I would have to disrupt myself, to start over again, to become a silly little thing. To go up, I would have to disrupt. Now, question for you. When has this happened in your life? You've taken a step back from where you are, what you believe, and people think you've lost your mind, but then you've discovered, just as the theory of disruption teaches, that this step back has been a slingshot. And I suspect that's going to be true for you in your PhD program. This step back, this time that you're taking to study will turn into a slingshot. I know that Linda, where are you, Linda, told me that that was the case for her. All right, story number three. This one has to do with money. And I have never shared this story in public before. In my family, there was never enough money. My parents constantly bickered about it. I would go to piano lessons, and my teacher would tell me that the check had bounced. They were going to pay for college, then they couldn't. And when my dad died a few years ago, he had $50 to his name. That wasn't going to be me. I was going to make money, and I did. And then we almost went bankrupt. I had absorbed my parents' belief about money, that there was never enough. And because I believed it, I had to figure out a way to make it true. It turns out that we always make what we believe to be true. I later discovered that I sort of inherited this belief, as, I, as did my parents. In doing our family history, I discovered that many of my ancestors lived a meager hand-to-mouth existence, even had a few in the poorhouse, like in a Charles Dickens novel. Generations. So it's not surprising that I had ingested this belief, hook, line, and sunk into insolvency. My there isn't enough was all exacerbated by my belief that if you have money, you're bad, and if you don't, well, then you're good. But now, I'm highly disoriented. We've almost gone bankrupt, after all. So I start questioning. I start studying. I study people like Bob Proctor and Earl Nightingale and Genevieve Birand. So here are the two beliefs I'd absorbed. If you have money, you're bad. I now believe that money is a resource. 
just as we would never say, she's surprisingly nice given how educated she is. Why would we say, wow, she's got all this money and she's still nice? Money is a resource. It expands our ability to do good beyond our physical presence. And bringing back that faith tradition, if God really wants us to do good, which I believe he does, the more resources we have, the more good we can do. Money is a resource. As for the belief that there isn't enough, I'm rewriting the code in my brain. I figure out what I want to be true, I write it down and I say it out loud over and over again, like I'm so happy and thankful that money is coming to us, that we're paying for our children's college, that we have X number of dollars in the bank, and that we're donating X number of dollars to scholarships at the university. Our subconscious, it can't distinguish between what is true and what is false, so I consciously decide what I want to be true, then my subconscious will figure out how to make it so, just like my parents and my grandparents before me. I love this quote from Anna Lepe. She said, every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want. I'm committed to casting a lot of votes. What are your assumptions about money? And are they valid? All right, story number four. This one has to do with the work that I do now. And again, this was prompted by a conversation with Joan. See, you just have to talk to her and she'll give you all sorts of ideas. And it sort of begins with my obsession around American Idol. It was around 2004, and American Idol was at its zenith. Personal branding was coming to the fore. Tom Peters had just written a brand called You. So when it's my turn to train my equity analyst colleagues, I decide to give a presentation on how each contestant in American Idol has a brand and that you as an analyst, an equity analyst, should have a brand too. So I spent hours and hours thinking about this. To my colleague that could pull apart a balance sheet, well, you're a forensic analyst. To the analyst who had worked in the industry for a couple of decades, who knew the industry backwards and forwards, you're the encyclopedic analyst. And to the analyst with spot on stock calls, well, you're the stock picker analyst. This was not my job to figure out the brand of each of my colleagues. I'm working on Wall Street, but I loved it. Now, remember back in 2005, as I just shared, I left. Two years later, in 2007, I launched the Disruptive Innovation Fund with Clayton and his son. But during the next five years, during my off time, the things I wasn't getting paid to do, I wrote a book called Dare, Dream, Do. I coach people just because I like to. I published an article in Harvard Business Review called Disrupt Yourself. And Clay is starting to say to me, you sure you don't want to be out doing this other thing because you're good at it and you love it. But I resisted. I resisted. Why wouldn't I do this? Why wouldn't I disrupt myself? Well, here come those beliefs again. I had to start questioning. I believed that working in venture capital legitimized me. I believed, I liked that when I told people I'm an investor working with Clay Christensen, people, they were impressed. What would they say if I went out on my own as an advisor, as a coach, in that false paradigm sort of way? This felt like I would be picking my pom-poms back up and pulling out of the game. With hindsight, and in the spirit of looking at the assumption behind the assumption, I wonder if this was about me not picking up my pom-poms or me just being really afraid to throw them down, to move from being a trusty number two to an entrepreneur, to a CEO building my own business. Finally, Clay persuaded me that I must. So in 2012, I began. Talk about self-directed learning. Not only developing the framework of personal disruption, but the S-curve of learning framework, but also figuring out how to build a business where the product is an idea. How to be a CEO, leading a team of people. I couldn't be happier. I like to spot momentum. I like to invest in companies, but I love 
to invest in people and their dreams. In Patricia Cranton's book, she quotes the educator Parker Palmer as saying, what a long time it can take to become the person one has always been. How often in the process we mask ourselves in faces that are not our own. How much dissolving and shaking of the ego we must endure before we discover our deep identity, the true self within every human being. What about you? What face are you masking that isn't your own? What do you love that you haven't yet fully incorporated into your life? All right, a few final thoughts before we start talking to each other. One of the things that no one tells you, the textbooks on disruption, they don't tell you, is that personal disruption, this journey that you're about to go on, is scary and it's lonely. Whenever you leave your comfortable perch of doing what you've always done, there's this feeling of free fall, a loss of identity. The P-E ratio, the puke to excitement ratio, is so uncomfortably high, you feel like you're on a thrill ride to zero, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't disrupt. It just means if you're scared and you're lonely, you're on the right path. If you're scared, if you're lonely, you're on the right path. In fact, if you have a feeling in the deepest part of yourself that you need to try something new and you don't, if you have that feeling that you need to let the people who work for you do something new, if you have that feeling and you won't let the water into the asphalt, you will die inside just a little. So what? What is your disruptive path? Why? Why do you disrupt? We give a lot of air time to building and buying disruptive organizations, organizations that can transform industries. But innovation ultimately begins on the inside. If you want to be an agent of disruption, an agent of transformation, first, go back to school like my grandmother, like you are doing, and become its subject. Said T.S. Eliot, do I dare, do I dare, do I dare disturb the universe? Do all of you? Thank you. questions and they suddenly don't seem relevant anymore <laughs> so I just want to make say a few things I probably won't sit down oh, with you but no. please sit down yeah. so first of all we are live streaming this so this is the first time we are live streaming this so we welcome everyone who is watching all the Aegis folks all the uh, TC folks that are watching uh, secondly you know what we do usually is we have a Q&A and we are welcome to do that. You can ask Whitney questions, and I'm sure she'll answer. But I want to challenge you to, rather than ask a question, tell your story. Tell your story about transformative learning or disruption, and see if you can connect them. See if you can make that personal connection. And while you think through that, I will ask Whitney a question, but just before I do that, I will come around with the mic. You want to speak in the mic so that the folks that are not here can hear you. You can also come to this mic and speak, but please speak into the mic so they can all have the benefit of what you're saying. And the last thing is you don't have to feel scared or lonely because you have a cohort supporting you. That's the beauty of Aegis.
So my first question for you, Whitney, is you talked a little bit about spirituality. And there is a strong current of research in, in our community which connects spirituality and transformative learning. In your mind, how does spirituality influence disrupting yourself? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I kind of skated around it a lot, um, but it, it, it's foundational. I mean, I, I think about my life and, you know, as I said earlier, I had to make this decision, and the research says that when you're in your 20s, you make your decision, right? You grow up, you're going to do whatever your parents were kind of doing, but in your 20s, you've got to make a you have to decide what you're going to do. And um, I made the decision that I believe in God, and that's even today a really tough decision, because for me, it was I believe in God, and what religion do I belong to? Well, for my children, it's just like, do I even believe in God? Like, it's a big, big question. Um, but to answer what you're asking me, Tej, I mean, it's the whole idea of that I believe that I can get better and better. I believe that after I die, I will continue to exist as I am. So I'm, I'm taking the long view and the long game. And I believe actually that I can get better. And I think sometimes people don't believe that they can get better. I know that Carol Dweck's research has come out and said, yes, we can all get better. But we still, a lot of the time, act like we don't believe that we can get better. You know, we say one thing, but we act a different way. So, so the short answer to your question is, it is, it is the, you know, sort of the bedrock of how I view the world and, and my belief that I can get better and that every single person I interact with can as well. Great. Thank you. So I'll open the floor up. Oh, come on. I want to hear all your stories. Who's going to be brave? You know what? Whoever gets up here first gets a free book. Okay, go. <laughs> it's good that I bought this one because I don't have that one yet. There you go. Okay. Okay, you're going to break the... Is it Roshan? Yes. Ro Roshan. Okay. Roshan. Rhymes with Roshan. Roshan. Okay. All right. Tell us your story. This started out as a question, but now it's also a story. Sorry, That's Patrick. Roshan's cohort supporting <laughs> You're like, good job, Roshan. You can do it. Now you've got to flick your hair. <laughs> okay, go. The image of climbing to the top of the ladder and then jumping to the next ladder was, is very intriguing to me. And my cohort know that I've been working for the same company for about 14 years. Uh, ever since I graduated from my master's in TC. And I feel I am at the top of this ladder or close to the top of this ladder. And my question and dilemma is that I feel I'm a very rational person and I think for very logical reasons I cannot jump to the next ladder. And I have some data that I hold closely around that. So I'm wondering, even if I think that these are truths, and I cannot evade them or go around them because these are very entrenched and established and in some cases by law, um, how can I disrupt that thinking to actually go to the next ladder? Okay, that's a great question. All right, so the book I want you to take for free is Build an A-Team because that All will right. start to answer some of these questions. Oh, thank you. But, um, <laughs> so, so here's what I would say. She'll when you sign it later. Yeah, I'll sign it for you. So, so what we didn't talk about tonight is that everybody is on an S curve or a learning curve. So it's the E.M. Rogers, he developed these S curves of learning. And when you're at the bottom of the curve, it's this whole jumble of pieces. You don't know what you're doing. You're trying to figure it out. And because, you know, lots of time passes and very little growth is happening, you can get discouraged. Then you move into the sweet spot of that curve where in a little time a lot happens. And this is the exciting part where all your neurons are firing. You know exactly what you're doing and you get to the top of the curve. And you're like, I'm a master, I should be happy. But guess what's happened? In a lot of time, very little happened. You're starting to chunk, things are easy for you. It's part of the reason you're getting bored. And what can happen is if you stay there too long, what looks like a plateau can become a precipice. So you just wanna have that in your mind as kind of a framework for you to think about. Now, to your specific question, um, one of the things you want to think about is 
what am I actually afraid of? Because I remember having a conversation a few years ago with a fellow who was at the top of his learning curve, and he said, I can't jump. And I said, why? And he said, well, because I don't have enough money. And I said, OK, how much money do you have in the bank? And he's like, 10 years worth of savings. <laughs> so it wasn't the money. It was something else. And what it turned out to be, and it oftentimes is, is when you're at the top of that curve and you're thinking about doing something new, you're like, oh no, I won't know what I'm doing. And this terrifies me because I might not do it well. So one of the ways you can motivate yourself to do something new, and this goes to loss aversion theory by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, is to think about not what good things will happen if you jump, but what bad things will happen if you don't. Because we're 2.25 times more motivated by um, what we will lose than by what we'll gain. So as you're trying to motivate yourself to jump, and there's a lot more that we could talk about, and I can, you can tell I would love to talk about this forever. Start thinking about, OK, so, so I know if I jump, it's kind of scary. But how is it scary if I don't jump? What am I going to lose? And one of the things you're going to lose here is you're going to be sad. You're going to have regrets. The other thing, too, you're going to lose is that because you know exactly what you're doing, your performance will start to decline. I actually have this theory that people lose their jobs. It's a, it's a theory. It's a hypothesis. Because they're at the top of a learning curve, and they know it's time to go, and they won't do it. So the universe gives them the nudge. That's what I believe. That's what happened to me when I lost my job. So wrapping up, you're on a learning curve. You're at the top of the learning curve. If it's time for you to jump, just know that it's not that it's not a good job. It's just your brain saying, I need to do something new. To motivate yourself, do it. Then you look at what you might lose. If for whatever reason you absolutely have to stay there, because like you said, there are some laws in place, then you find ways to jump in place by really focusing on how can I get better, maybe get a coach. You also look for ways to stretch yourself in place and then also look at becoming a mentor to, or a master to an apprentice. So those are the th three things you can do if you have to stay. But I suspect your cohort can support you in this, and I'm not even listening now. And, your and cohort Roshan, mm -hmm. can support you in thinking through what you might do differently. And okay? Roshan, I'm gonna channel our own Lyle and say, how much of that closely held data that you have are data, and how much of those are assumptions? Mm. Yeah. Thank good you. Question. All right. Good job, Roshan. Who wants to go next? You're going to make me give another way, another book, aren't you? Okay. Come on, someone else. Let's go. All right. We want a woman. Yeah. Good. We have to man, woman, man, woman. Yeah. Okay. Hi. <laughs> My name is Cheryl. Um, thank you so much, Whitney, for your points and your thought. I found it very thought-provoking. I have a story and a question also. Okay, good. Um, what's interesting is Clayton Christensen's one of my heroes. I have a career in product development and innovation and actually was at um, doing a certificate program at Harvard, and, and Clay was one of my professors and um, really got me thinking. And you, know, it's always, you always get nervous during the breaks when Clay starts asking you about your company and, and wanting to do a case on your company. Um, but he was asking some really provocative questions that made me think about what was going to happen in the industry that I was in. And, and I, would, I would argue that um, he's one of the reasons why I'm doing my dissertation on innovation and his whole concept of milkshake marketing and all of that. Nice. Um, so that's a story and an yeah. inflection point that centers around Clay. But my so question if you will, sorry, if you'll send me a quick email about that, I'll forward that to him so he can know. I would that. love that. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Wow. Um, my question to you is that this concept of disruption, obviously we hear a lot about it, but what I've been reading in the literature lately, you know, as part of doing my dissertation, is that some of the assumptions that Clay has made around disruption and, and that started with the innovator's dilemma are being challenged with Absolutely. respect to how that works. So I was just wondering if you, just, just as your own reflections with your work as well as Clay's work, to talk about how some of the, the discourse is changing yeah. around what it means to disrupt. Yeah, so great question. So one of the things I think is really interesting is there was this wonderful uh, quote actually by Clayton and Paul Carlyle, so he's at Boston University, who said, whenever you find an anomaly, it's an opportunity to improve the theory. And one of the things about a theory is it's, it's just a theory. So there are going to be times when it's not right, 
And one of the things I thought was interesting is at this point, that theory of his is about 20 years old. So it's still very much in its adolescence. And so when you find these ideas that are counter to what they're saying, you're like, okay, this is interesting. This is additional data that allows us to improve and enhance that theory and make it more robust. I think part of the difficulty as well is that because disruptive innovation has become such a buzzword, people use it to describe something that actually isn't disruptive, and I think that's part of it as well. Um, but in general, my sense is you get that, you get those data points, and it's an opportunity to improve upon the theory, knowing that no theory is 100% foolproof. Yeah, you're welcome. Who wants to go next? Okay, and then we're going to okay, need way, one guys, more woman. Cohort 27. One 26, more woman nine. after him. <laughs> yes, hello. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I, in terms of my uh, practice, I, I'm a, uh, I lead the learning function in a city agency here in New York. Okay. And I see myself less as a disruptor and more as a change agent in terms of what I've been doing for the last 18 years of my career. So just, <clears throat> excuse me, just curious about uh, where you see the disruptor, the individual, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the systems change work that we're either part of or a witness to, because it's, you know, in this day and age, it's constantly occurring around us, whether we're part of it or not. But right. just curious around your thoughts about uh, being a disruptor as part of the larger system? Okay, great question. Um, so what I would say is um, it's a both and. I, I think that in order for you to be able to be the change agent, um, you have to want to be that change agent, but you've got to have the system in place that makes that possible. Otherwise, um, this, the, the system is going to chew you up and spit you out, and that's what sometimes happens is that people are trying to make changes, and the system just it rejects it. Now, I think as the individual, and I'll talk about the system in a minute, the individual can, there are things that you can do as an individual that allow you to be more effective. One of the things I talk about in the framework of personal disruption is the number four is battle or sense of entitlement. Sometimes, at least I know in my own history, there have been things that I've been trying to change, and I'm like, they're not happening. And I realize that I'm actually being entitled. I'm, I'm taking this approach of, well, it's a good idea, therefore I should just have buy-in as opposed to that individual and me, in this particular instance, figuring out a way, how do I, when I'm trying to do this idea, I'm effectively jumping to a new ladder, I, or I want to jump to a new ladder, uh, or jump to a brand new learning curve, but I'm also asking the people in my system to jump to a new learning curve as well. And that looks really scary, because it's not their learning curve, it's mine. So how do I de-risk it? How do I make it safe for them to jump to that brand new learning curve? So. So that's the sort of the onus on me or you as an individual change agent. From there, I would say, um, in addition to that, I would say sometimes we get into systems and we think, well, you know, people will say to me, well, could you just tell my boss to let me disrupt? And I'm like, well, yeah, I can. But there's a lot that I can do within my sphere of influence with the people who work for me to disrupt and start to build up proof points for them. Okay, so that's the individual. From a systemic standpoint, what I would say is that systems are in place in order to be efficient. So if you think about the loan of the learning curve where it's messy, 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 this miasma, people are trying to figure it out, disruption works really well. But when you move into the steep part of the curve, part of what you're trying to do is be systemic, be efficient to make things happen. And so the, so the system is in place for a reason. Um, so what we're looking for is a system that makes it more possible, not less, for us to do our work. But in general, because the system is in place for a very good reason, a lot of, again, the, the burden is on us to try to try to affect that change. Okay, good. Come get a book. All right, should we do one more? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hi, um, Cynthia Russell, thank you very much for sharing your stories. I've, I'm also, I went through the Aegis program, but I'm also a coach. And I find it really interesting because um, I think about people, what really disruption means to me, and I don't know if you would agree, is being open to the opportunity for change. And that openness as a coach, creating that um, ability for people to recognize that opportunity is really hard. So I'm wondering in your research and experience, what you find are 
some of the biggest obstacles um, for individuals to see that opportunity for change and how you can help people to sort of, um, overcome that? So I think the biggest obstacle is fear. It, it's fear, right? It, it, so I guess the question, I would want to have more information because it depends on if the person's getting coached because they want to be coached or if they've been mandated to be coached. Right, so if it's like, hey, you need to be coached, then sometimes there's a lot more resistance to it because like, I don't even think I need a coach. What's happening? They get, you know, they get their 360, they go into major denial about all their blind spots, et cetera. So I think in that particular instance, um, part of the challenge is to help them see that if they, they're already fairly effective, that's why the company's investing in them getting coached. But if they don't want to get left behind, they've got to figure out how to remediate some of their blind spots, but then focus on what their strengths are. Um, I would say with it, w whether it's, and then with someone who wants to change, I think what I find is very effective is to say to them, okay, so here are some things that you need to work on to improve. You've got to mitigate these in order to move forward, to move up that learning curve. But let's really, really focus on what you do well and double down on that because that's what the research is telling us. The only way for a person to become truly excellent at what they, uh, in anything, is for them to figure out what they do well and do more of that. Um, so again, I think in this situation where they want to be coached, they, they're, gonna, they're gonna put in the work. It's just a matter of kind of guiding them and, and your job more is to just be a safe space for them when they're feeling vulnerable and scared to say, you can do it, you can do it. And when they don't want to change is to try to move them along and get them to the point where they're not quite so scared. Sometimes they'll get over it and sometimes they won't. Um, but people, we can't make anybody change. And that's the thing, I, you know, one other thought I'm having, I remember having, being very frustrated with a person who had come to me for coaching and, um, and talking to my coach and saying, oh, he's not changing. And then my coach said to me, well, but how do you know he's not getting what he needs from the coaching? Like, who are you to say, like, what he should be doing? Like, maybe he's getting what he needs from this. And so then the question becomes is, are you okay delivering what it is he needs? And, in, and so is that, does that mean it's actually not a fit for you? Now, interestingly enough, he didn't want to change, and like three or four months later, he said, yeah, I don't want to be coached anymore. Because he didn't really want to change. So... Okay, good. Who wants to go next? I'm so happy, usually in situations like this, like oftentimes it's men asking all the questions and I have to like force the women to talk. And this time it's like, it's fantastic. It's like boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, go. All right, well thank you Whitney again for, for being here. Um, my name's David, and I'm part of Aegis 26. Um, yeah. And um, I uh, hold a couple of different identities, and I'm gonna bring up the one that I think I have the most challenges with um, right now, and that's as a reserve officer in the United States Army. Thank and, you um, for your service. Thank you. Uh, a few years ago, I, I completed a program here that was transformative for me. And uh, certainly I feel uh, or felt was a, a significant disruption and ultimately led me to Aegis. Uh, but it also um, showed me how much challenge is associated with that deep structural work. And now that I know that, and I've sort of personally felt it, I almost feel like that knowing is also getting in the way of now adding to further disruption. Uh, is that something that's common and is there a sort of um, whether it's in your book or just personally, things that you can point to to say, hey, yeah, that, that's about right, yeah. or um, here's some other things to consider. So, um, so first of all, I think you know that this idea of we can sometimes know too much, um, that can really get in our way. And so I think um, sometimes you have to kind of just step back and say, all right, I'm gonna pretend like I don't know this. It's, it's fascinating to me, actually. This is a little bit of digression, but I think it's relevant. I, I struggle with perfectionism. Anybody in the room struggle with perfectionism? Okay, so I struggle with perfectionism. I think about the fact that I've written three books and people will be like, well, are you really a perfectionist? 
You know why I was able to write those books? Is I've never ever self-identified as a writer. Never self-identified as a writer. I don't call myself a writer. So the books didn't have to be perfect. They just had to do the job that I needed them to do. So I think one of the things I would say initially is as you're trying to affect this change is if you can kind of pull your identity away from that and not self-identify around that, then it's easier. So I struggle a lot more with music because I self-identified as a musician. That's where the perfectionism kicks in, but not around writing. So that would be one thought for you. The second thing I would say to you is, you know, back to the question that Tej asked earlier about change. Change is a very gradual, lengthy process. And sometimes people will say to me, well, okay, so you read this book and, you know, but nothing changed. And I look at it and I say, you know what? If I read a book and I do one thing differently because I read that book, then, that, then I've improved. And tomorrow if I read another book and I do one thing differently, then I've improved again. And so what I would say to you in this thing where it looks really big is to make it small. Make it really small. If today one person who works with you feels like what they do matters, then that's a win. And if tomorrow one person sees themselves differently and then they go home and they see their wife and their children or their husband differently because of what you did, then that's another win. And so I would just pull it all the way back, make it micro, because it's in those micro actions that you get this huge macro and aggregate. And so, again, maybe pull away the identity, separate out the identity, and then make it, excuse me, really small. And then you'll start to see that you're actually making a lot of difference. So that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. So folks, I, I want to bring, uh, bring this to a close to keep, keep in with the time. So I want to do a few things. One is I want to leap off the perfectionist comment over here and advise Aegis 26 that there is no perfect dissertation. <laughs> there, there are only done dissertations. <laughs> and I want to wish you well as you do your last summer of coursework and then embark on the dissertation journey. Aegis 27, I want to welcome you to the Aegis family. It's a wonderful family. 